and how we actually try and facilitate partnership and grant making with the folks that we give money to to do great work. So why this work? Why this work at the intersection of climate change, health, and equity? Well, it's probably very obvious to you, and I'm not going to preach to the choir, but climate change is getting worse. Of course, those that are impacted are those that are low-income communities and communities of color. Um, and it's about time that we all come together. When I started this climate work over 20-some years ago, um, there were a lot of folks that weren't talking to each other. It was divides between different sectors, between those that were environmental mainstream groups and those that were environmental justice groups. And I feel like that is changing. So again, the environment program and the health program at Crezzi have always done grant making on elements of climate change and health and equity. But I would say in the last year and a half, we've made a more intentional effort to bring these programs together under the initiative Logan talked about. So it's our CHI initiative, Climate Change Health and Equity Initiative, and we have really three distinct but aligned strategies. The first is really working on the institutional side. So your health and hospital systems, your local health departments, um, and some of the grantees that we have in that mix are our Americans Essential Hospitals, um, Healthcare Without Harm, that was mentioned yesterday, um, the CDC Foundation that's doing our local public health departments, and a couple of those, I won't name them all. Um, the second strategy is focused on practitioners. So these are your folks that are with the American Public Health Association, the Lions of Environmental Health Nurses, Dr. Mona and the Medical Society Consortium on Climate Change, uh, Michigan Community Health Workers, and a bunch of folks that are high touch to the folks that, again, really need to understand and use education around climate change to protect folks. And the third bucket, which I say is the newest bucket, is our community-based partnerships. Again, supporting about 15 organizations across the country that are now in the planning phase, which includes these wonderful ladies up here, um, to really, again, foster partnerships, but really figure out what is an endpoint, a policy endpoint that they can work on together with these new partnerships to build climate resilience among communities. So that's a little bit about the initiative. And what I will say, within the initiative, again, you need to count how many times I say partnerships, the building of partnerships are super valuable. And I would say particularly with our community leaders. So if we are going to be successful, I think, in really tackling climate change, health and equity, there's a couple things that we need to keep in mind. Um, we need local action, state action, and federal action. And again, what's beautiful is that when you have partnerships and networks of folks that are working on this, everybody can kind of find their lane. So that is the beauty of partnerships. The beauty of partnerships is building solidarity. One thing that I like to say is my fight is your fight. And when we get to that point, that's when we're really gonna see change in this arena. The second piece is we have to, we must continue to address structural and institutional racism. Because we can work on the symptoms all day long, but until we get to those things within these institutions, between the energy sector, the water sector, the healthcare sector, until we dig down and figure out like, you know, what is really going on and why certain folks are being left out, we're just going to be spinning our wheels. So again, I look forward to the conversation. I look forward to hearing from our partners at Catalyst and um, Partnership for Southern Equity. And um, yeah, look forward to the conversation. So thank you. Shandra Farley from the Partnership for Southern Equity to discuss uh, what her organization is doing in Georgia around this world. Thank you, Logan. Um, thanks, everyone, and thank you, Jalon um, and Kresge, for um, having the foresight to put this initiative together. Uh, I am based in Atlanta, Georgia, Partnership for Southern Equity. We are a racial equity organization and believe that advancing racial equity um, can ultimately create sheer prosperity for all across metropolitan Atlanta, the state of Georgia, and the American South. So I am, just to Jalon's point, um, sort of the PSE way of, of working on things is that we lead with race. And that, that is very important. 
and I talk about what our core focus areas are. Um, Logan mentioned I'm the director of our Just Energy program. That's where our energy equity and climate justice work sits. Uh, we have our Just Growth Initiative, which is focuses on equitable development, anti-displacement, uh, water equity work. This is some more work that we do along with Kresge, green infrastructure, uh, economic inclusion, which is um, really self-explanatory economic um, employment equity, access to market, and our newest um, issue area, which began as a health uh, special project, is health equity, um, which is just health. So when I, sometimes when people know what I do and sort of know my background and here are our, our issue areas, um, sometimes we're put into the environmental group, but I'm always very explicit and intentional about saying we are a racial equity organization and first, and these are the issue areas um, that we work on. We're not an environmental organization doing racial equity work. And um, the reason that our founder and chief equity officer, uh, Nathaniel Smith, focused on these issue areas is because, as we all know, um, people aren't poor on Monday and then sick on Tuesday and then pain not being able to afford their electricity bill or pay their grandmother's bill on Wednesday and Friday. It's like all of these things are happening um, all the time on top of each other. So we are very intersectional in, in our work um, in the organization. And when I joined PSE uh, in January 2018, our Just Health project was uh, just getting off the ground and focused on the 11 most rural counties in Georgia. And this was a partnership with the Healthcare Foundation of Georgia and began um, really around speaking to community-based partnerships, working with some of those community health organizations in rural areas where Maybe there might only be one doctor for literally 100 square miles, or folks um, have to drive two or three hours um, to, to see a doctor. Um, so really getting into community to understand um, how poverty and race, even in rural Georgia, um, has impacts on uh, health care, um, energy costs, health costs. So over the last couple of years, we've been sharing articles back and forth, I think on the energy side, um, the health piece, particularly when we're talking about environmental justice, is something that always comes up. Um, but we were always trading back, you know, climate change and health articles, you know, with, the, with our health team. So the Kresge Project opportunity has really given us an opportunity to move forward intentionally um, with building a new issue area um, of our work. So we are really excited um, to kick that project off. And some of you um, were in the Collaborating for Equity session yesterday, and it's really all about how we do our work. So when Jalan was talking about um, community-based partnerships, um, we operate really first around shared vision and values. We begin all our coalition work that way, um, but also uh, TRP trust, respect, and partnership. So all of those things really um, make sure that we are able to be in authentic relationship with the community and understand that if we don't have the same, if we don't share vision in our work and if we don't have a set of shared values and a shared understanding of why we do the work that we do, the why question um, is important, um, then no matter what the issue is, we'll just keep trying to fix the symptoms. We're never going to get to the root cause. So no matter what our issue area is, um, we literally begin with a vision and values workshop. So we bring together um, uncommon allies, uh, if you will. So all of our issue areas that I mentioned have an issue circle. So our climate change health equity project will literally establish a just health circle. So the way that we do that is our just energy circle is actually um, our oldest um, circle at PSE, if you will, um, the most built out, and we're in our sixth year. And we have a set of values. Um, if you go to psequity.org, <laughs> you can see um, all, of our, all of our issue areas and our just energy page you can link out to a micro slide about our circle and all of our values are listed there. So we literally 
bring people together, like a lot of folks in this room, I think it's changing a little bit, but the technical experts, um, the you know practitioners, the professional advocacy groups <coughs> around the, the utilities, um, the community action agencies, um, with student groups, faith leaders, <coughs> um, clergy-based organizations, and frontline grassroots organizations, frontline organizations, and um, we're all familiar with that. So we all come together really with one goal, and that is to advance more equitable policy, whether that's energy, climate, um, development, displacement, uh, and health, as, as we're talking about today. And I think um, we always make the joke, I'm, I was thinking about it last night, and I was tweeting with Amy Laura, I hope she's here, about, um, you know, we like to say that equity is the new coconut water. And I feel like maybe we should start saying it's the new seltzer water, because like that's the new popular thing now. But, but the reason that is is because equity set is very nice. Like we really all want it. I, I believe that we really, you know, all want it and believe. But sometimes that's more palatable than really what we're talking about is justice. Like equity is giving us the space to talk about why things are not equal and why it's not enough to just talk about wanting equality. Um, so I think that's that's really important and not clear on how much time I have, so I'm going to loop back to um, close. But one of the key things that, that we begin with, you know, our shared foundation of equity. And in a lot of these conversations, you know, we have working groups and we have meetings and we go to conferences and, you know, people reach out to PSC and say, yeah, you know, we really want to do equity. And it's like, we don't really do equity. <laughs> Um, so I think it's first and foremost, um, for if you are in a group and an equity conversation comes up, is there a definition of equity? Has your table, has your working group, has your organization, have you defined what equity means for you and your organization, you and your work, you and your partners? Um, our shared foundation of equity and definition is, is really it's just and fair inclusion. And um, until, I'm going to, you know, muddle it um, a little bit, but do you care and why do you care? And if you care, what are you willing to do about it? Um, and I think that really, you know, forms the basis of the, you know, the reason that um, equity is becoming like such an important thing to talk about because we realize that um, our neighbors, our grandparents, our high school classmates, um, our, our church members, um, there are some of those folks who are experiencing the very real impacts of, of climate change and all of the associated um, health impacts that come along with that. There are people who are experiencing that first and worst, first and most, um, and our interventions, mitigation, the adaptation, all of those things are not reaching um, the people who need to and stand um, to benefit the most. So um, I'll close by saying, and I said this yesterday, is to remember that equity is about a way of doing things. It's not a what. Um, and, and the journey to get there is just as important um, as what as the outcome when we get there. Thank you, John. is Myra Cruz with the with Catalyst Miami. Um, she's doing really exciting work, uh, and so I'm going to hand it to her and let her talk about it. Thank you, everyone. Um, nice to see you all this morning. Um, we didn't pray too hard last night. Um, but uh, yeah, first I want to say thank you to uh, the Cressy Foundation for really providing this opportunity for us. Um, I'll probably you'll hear a lot of similar themes and everything that we've been saying up here. Um, but first, I want to talk more about um, Catalyst Miami and what we do. Um, sometimes I feel like we're a bit of a unicorn because we are a nonprofit. Um, we're based in Miami, Dade County. Uh, we provide direct human services to primarily low, middle income <coughs> um, So for us, the mission really is to improve the health and wealth of those community members. Um, so we provide financial services for free. Um, right now, tax season is coming up, so it's a really busy time in our office. Um, we have a lot of families coming to us for that, that help with filling out their taxes. 
Um, we also uh, provide help with healthcare access. Um, I think we all know that it can be very confusing navigating our healthcare system, figuring out Medicare, Medicaid, what you need to apply for things. So we also provide that for free for our community members. Um, and I would say, and this happened before I arrived there, but uh, a few years ago, it became really apparent that it was important for us to be in the climate space because oftentimes, as, we, as we've talked about many times before, um, especially the clients that we serve are the ones that are feeling those impacts of climate change already and may not have um, the financial stability or um, access to healthcare that they need to really uh, be prepared when these changes are happening. Um, one story that sticks out to me um, from Hurricane Irma in particular, I know we had a client that was a small business owner, he had a restaurant, um, and of course, even though it was in a, a major hurricane forest in, in Florida, um, he still you know, didn't have lights on for a while. Um, he did lose all the produce he had in his uh, restaurant. There's all these things that were happening um, with the restaurant, and so he was worried about trying to make ends meet at that point. And so we had our financial coaches step in, help him to get an emergency loan, but not everyone knows where to go to get those things, or, you know, at that point in time, you're very stressed out, you don't know what to do, and that's just like one story of what we're already seeing in Miami especially. Um, so just to paint a big, bigger picture of what we're dealing with there, um, you know, people like to say we're at the front line of climate change. Um, in some ways, we definitely are, uh, given sea level rise happening there already. Um, we hear more stories about salt water coming in. Um, we also are dealing with extreme heat, and that's one that we are, are focusing on a lot more now, especially because I think there's this myth that just because we live in Miami, we're used to the heat, um, we can handle it getting hotter and hotter every summer. And I think we all know that that's not the case, um, especially when we think about those that don't have access to AC or can't afford to pay those increasingly high bills. Um, or as was mentioned yesterday during Dr. Benjamin's talk, you know, we do have people live in homes that have bars on them, they can't open them. So there's all these barriers that have been in place for, for years now, and I think, I think to everyone in this room, it's becoming really apparent that these systemic inequalities that have been around, we're starting to really see the impacts of what that's led to now. Um, and I'll also mention, we do have an affordable housing crisis in Miami. Um, it's a very expensive city to live in. Um, one of the most unequal in the country. Um, so we also have people that, you know, I personally, even just in the last years, I'm starting to see more homelessness um, happen in the city. Um, so that's something that we're combating as well. So you kind of have this unfortunate trifecta of, we, yes, we have climate issues, we have people that can't afford to live. Um, we are seeing health impacts already. Um, I know Dr. Holder's in the room somewhere, but um, she, I, I remember when I was coming to Miami, I read some of her articles where she talked about just like anecdotal stories of her patients talking about like running out of their inhalers more quickly now because of longer allergy season. So you kind of get the picture. There's a lot that's happening, a lot that we're dealing with, and that's really why we do see an importance in us being at that intersection of climate, health, and equity. Because I think, as I mentioned, there's so many systems that have been set up in a way where they unfairly impact especially if people are lower income, people of color. Um, and so if we, if we don't address those and really meet them head on, then as John was mentioning, we are gonna spin our wheels and not get to the root of the issue. Um, so Catalyst, as I mentioned, we've been doing this work the last few years. Um, through another Presky grant, we have our climate leadership training program where we do teach community members about um, climate issues and how they're impacting them in their community, but also the solutions. Um, and to me, that's been a really great way of getting to know community members, really meeting them where they're at, and learning about what they care about, what they see as the solutions. Because oftentimes, it is the community members that have those amazing ideas as to how to solve the problems. You don't always need the architect or the engineer or whoever um, to provide those ideas. Uh, oftentimes, you can just go and talk to someone, and they can tell you what needs to be done in their community. Um, and so just to say that, for us, it's been really important to also lead with like that racial equity, um, I don't want to say lens, because I think it's something that just should be ingrained in everything that you do. 
um, so it's something that I'm personally trying to back away from saying equity as a lens. It's, it should just be at the root of everything you do. Um, and to speak more on the uh, Crespi grant that we have, um, I will also probably say partnerships a lot because we have many of them. Um, but for example, we've partnered with uh, the Clio Institute. They're a nonprofit that focuses on climate education. We also have the Miami Foundation, which is a local funder um, in our area that is also very progressive in how um, they're giving out their money. Um, and I will say Miami especially, we don't have a lot of big local funders, so to us it's a very important relationship. Um, I would say FI, uh, Florida International University, FIU, has been such a great partner for us um, for years now, and, and they're also part of this initiative. Um, they have the Sea Level Solutions Center, which um, is a great interdisciplinary group of people at the institution that do focus on sea level rise issues, um, but they also more recently have been focusing on extreme heat issues. Um, so that's one partnership that's been fun where we've you know, been doing citizen science with our community members, um, and we've given them out sensors, heat sensors to put out in communities um, to see um, just the ambient temperatures, what are we seeing out in real life. Um, and while this is just in the pilot phase, Already, we've seen that in certain areas, the the temperatures are extremely high to the point of being very dangerous for our community members, and we already see a discrepancy between what we see at like the weather station we have that tells us what the temperatures are and what we're seeing on the ground. So that's just one example of a of a partnership um, being really helpful in terms of combining like the science with the community members' perspective of what they care about. Um, we also have Florida Commissions for Climate Action, um, and their focus of really educating uh, health practitioners on the importance of climate change, and that they're speaking on that with their, their patients. Um, and then I think there's one more, I know there's a lot of them. Um, there's also FIU Neighborhood Health, um, which is really putting medical professionals out in the community. Um, so you can see we have a really good combination of partners for this initiative, and I think especially uh, going back to what Chandra was saying, it's just such a great opportunity to really be intentional about this work. So I think, you know, we've worked with all of these groups at one point or another, um, or partner, have partnered before, but I don't think we've ever all been in one room where we're having these discussions. Um, so we're still in the early phases of the work, but so far, um, I'm really thankful that Zalal, who's in the audience over there, she's our senior policy, uh, de wait, title change, Senior <laughs> Director of Policy and Advocacy, changed a few times. Um, but I was really thankful that when we first started the initiative, she grounded all of us in a conversation around equity as well, and making sure that everyone was on the same page about that, because I think um, we start these partnerships, not everyone might understand that equity is important, but we might all see it, see like the end goal in a different way, or how we get there in a different way, so I think it's just really important to ground that work from the start, so we make sure that no one is confused and that we're all heading in the right direction. And some people might need to be pulled along along the way. This might be new to them. But um, we're excited to kick off the work, and we're, we've come together to create a survey to get a better sense of what um, our community members um, care about in terms of climate and health. And also, um, we're talking with elected officials about that as well, because we know they have the power oftentimes, but not necessarily, are connecting the dots as well. Um, and also uh, giving out a survey to our health practitioners and our doctors um, to also see if they're making those connections. But we're hoping that with all that information, with conversations that we're having, that we'll be able to create a theory of change that will present them to back to the community and get their ideas on how we can work together to create these policies that can hopefully address these issues um, that are at the nexus of climate and health and so I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. I might just give some really great examples of partnerships that Catalyst is already a part of. Um, and it's so clear that these kinds of large, what historically have lived in silos, climate change and health and, and equity, um, that the only way that they can really move forward is if they are moving forward in these um, whether it's a partnership or a collaborative or an alliance or a circle or a gaggle or a, I don't know what, what other collective noun we want to use. Um, but I'd be curious about um, how Kresge, as, um, as the, the foundation was looking at putting these um, 
these dollars out onto the ground to, to, to get this work going around the country, um, thinking about how to, to best pull together the, the right kinds of partnerships. And then also talk a little bit about maybe um, where, some examples of where um, partnerships or collaboratives maybe have hit bumps in the road and some recommendations that you might have. Um, any or all of you can, uh, can speak to this. Um, so that, because I know that probably everyone in the room is working in some kind of, I mean, maybe raise your hand. Are you working in one of these collaboratives or, or um, alliances? I know I sure am. Yeah, I mean, that's how we have to work now, right? Um, so I know everybody in the room is always looking for tips and tricks, so uh, let's, let's see if we can hear some. Okay, um, so going back to uh, the initiative, this is still very early on, like I mentioned, but um, for example, when we were creating our survey and trying to figure out, you know, who's in charge of doing what and who's going to send it out to who, all of that stuff. Um, we kind of all realized, okay, we do have some researchers in the group, they should probably be in charge of um, creating the survey, making sure that it makes sense. And while this is very, it sounds basic when I'm saying it out loud, I think it is really important to take stock of the expertise that you do have in the room and what makes the most sense to be efficient with what you have. Um, so for us, of course, it made sense to be in charge of the community um, member part of that because we have such close ties with community members that for us and for CLEAR, our other nonprofit partner, for us to take the lead on that. Um, and then, of course, we have for the Commission for Climate Action, it makes sense for them to be um, in charge of uh, the health practitioner surveys, for example. But I think it's, uh, it's just important to know what you have in the room and how you can really leverage that expertise in a way that really makes sense. And if it's not a good fit, I think that's fine and that's a, something to know. Um, but I think it's just helpful to to realize that you don't have to force things to happen if they're not organic. I think for us, that was something that was very organic that we didn't feel like it needed to be forced upon anyone. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So our circles, um, I mentioned the Just Energy Circle um, is the oldest. We do have the Just Growth Circle, um, which technically has more organizations. We're about, um, 21 now uh, with the Just Energy Circle. We only um, invite organizations one time a year. So we have, I mentioned our principles. Um, we also have a collaborative covenant which lays out um, how we operate um, as an organization. So Partnership for Southern Equity is the convener. And we have an executive committee. Uh, we have a policy and advocacy committee. We have um, an education and action committee and we have an Energize and Connect committee. So Energize and Connect is kind of the organizing arm, um, if you will. And all of our committees um, are co-chaired by PSE and a member organization. And that just helps with, with continuity. So um, we take nominations all year. Anybody can come to a Just Energy Circle meeting and we take nominations um, and then, then we onboard. One thing that's been really important to us as far as just finding fit, and um, is that we sort of have this Noah's Ark approach. So for every quote unquote big green or technical assistance organization, um, we have to pair them with a community-based organization or a frontline organization, um, basically the opposite, um, if you will. So I think all of those different structures really give people lots of latitude about where they want to um, in, engage in the work. Sometimes it's very strategic, sometimes we have folks, you know, we definitely want to ask. Um, so I think that helps with people being, you know, being able to figure out um, where to plug in. And we'll take, we'll take a similar approach um, with developing our, our Just Health Circle. And we have a lot, you know, a lot of our Just Energy Circle member organizations are kind of already doing some health work. Um, in their organizations or in, in other coalitions. So I'm um, looking forward to, to how that's gonna, gonna develop. And just being you know, real clear about what the goal is. Sometimes it's gonna change. Um, it's relationships. I mean, literally, partnerships are, are relationships. Um, I'm not married, maybe that's the reason why, because I do coalition work, I don't know. <laughs> but you know, it, it can be difficult sometimes, but you know, you put so much 
much work into building the relationship. I mean, really, it's all about everything we do together, revisiting our values um, in a lot of meetings, just to have open conversations, um, inviting the partners every other month. Um, we spend our second hour either with new partners or new member organizations just kind of talking about our work and creating safe space. Like we start our meetings with equity reflections. That's something we borrow from another circle. It can be personal. It can be work. Um, but just, again, just as important as it is about the issue, um, we just have to create the safe space for people um, to feel like that they have the place to have the tough conversations because the work is hard. Um, and if we agree to disagree, you know, it's, it's fine, but, you know, we're still moving forward um, and you know, we're just learning as we go. I'll just say I'll be married 17 years and it is a lot of work. <laughs> marriages and I've learned that is not the way to go. Um, you know, like you said, people are going to eventually hopefully come together. You can make the introduction, you can do the speed dating, but how folks gel, um, we have to let that happen. So that's one thing that, that again we try not to do. But I think also funders have the role as we work with our partners and we identify or they identify needs and say, hey, I need to be connected with such and such for this then that is our job. So what I try and do is connect across sectors, across geographies, et cetera, just because I believe like everybody has something of value and something to offer. So I see that as uh, my role. The one um, example that I will lift up as I think is something that's an example of um, a way a collaboration or partnership could come together is something we supported through Policy Link, and it's the Water Equity and Climate Resilient Caucus. And so I had this idea because I was a little bit frustrated that, and this is on the water climate side, that uh, there weren't a lot of low-income communities and folks of color working on water policy, particularly addressing urban flooding and, and affordability. And uh, even within some of the larger coalitions of your mainstream environmental groups, um, these organizations were not present in those conversations. So we've seen historically that when you have your mainstream greens, uh, policies get made, advocate, and there's no thought or contemplation about the consequences of the policy that you're putting together on low-income folks and communities of color. So gave possibly some funding to just explore, to see if people even wanted to come together around water and climate resilience. Um, and to this day, I'm proud to say that, again, I, I took my hands off. I said, go explore, see if folks want to do it. And two years later, there's 90 plus organizations that have come together that have been advocating on water and climate resilience over the past year. They've shifted appropriations for the EPA to work on water. I mean, just so many great things. But the most important thing is that these folks walk working across the country are working in solidarity. So it doesn't matter if there's a group in Georgia I'm helping this group in Pennsylvania on some city council issues. So they're working across geographies, across levels and layers, and it's indigenous folks. I mean, it's everybody. So it's just amazing. And so I think, you know, it could have been the other way around. It could have been like, we really don't want to work on it. And then that's when July, I say, okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, you know, let go of my ego and what I think is a good idea, because it's not always a good idea what funders come up with. So um, that's an example of something that I think has worked out well. Um, now, putting on my hat, when I worked for a community-based organization, one of the things that worked well for us was having an MOU with the partners. So establishing up front, okay, what am I going to bring to this? What are the expectations? And oh, by the way, I don't care if you're coming with the most money and I'm just a local mom, we are all on the same playing field when we sit around this table. So I think establishing some type of whatever you want to call it, memorandum of understanding, whatever, is super important. But I think also, again, appreciating that everybody, I think somebody touched on it, everybody is on a different equity journey. Um, so who am I to say that I know equity better than you? It's my job to help bring you up. And so when you talk about partnerships, it's really appreciating and respecting where folks are, but also giving folks the room to mess up, <laughs> to make mistakes and not condemn them. We are not perfect. 
there are some things that I'm going to say or do that might not, you know, vibe well, but we need to be forgiving. We need to allow people to grow because then, again, I think everybody will grow together. So just wanted to throw those things out there. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah. <laughs> open one other uh, question idea, and I'd like for everyone to start thinking about if you have questions for this incredible uh, set of women, um, start formulating them, and we have a microphone in the middle of the room here, um, so uh, just wanted to prepare you so it's not cold. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to, to ask about, um, and this is a question, I guess, both for, um, from the funding side and from the sort of doing the work on the ground side. I think it's really interesting um, the way that this particular um, climate health and equity initiative um, is starting in a planning phase. So pulling together these partners, um, and I will let Jalan really talk a little bit more about that. You touched on it a, a bit. Um, but giving these partnerships this um, early opportunity to kind of work together and plan and gel um, before going out in the field and, and, and getting this work, you know, fully rooted. And so I'd be curious both from, from Jalan's perspective, from the, the programming side, and then also um, for those of you who are working in this way, um, what those benefits are and, and how you're taking this time to work and develop those relationships, uh, those just relationships amongst one another. I think that's a great question. And, and just very quickly, so this is, uh, Right now, we have 15 organizations that are in the planning phase, so it's a year-long planning phase. And then after that, we'll do some hard selections of about 12 to 15 of the organizations that we will fund through a three-year implementation phase with continued funding. So, you know, a couple things and reasons why we did that. Oftentimes, I don't think we give folks enough time and resources to actually think about what they want to do. Um, and this is just my personal opinion. And so that is, that is, I think, really the crux of it. Like, uh, the organizations that, the 15 that, that we selected, which was really hard, because we had over 400 something applications. I mean, it was wonderfully ridiculous to know that there are a lot of folks doing great work, but very hard, because there's so many organizations doing great work. So, um, you know, we, select organizations that were pretty mature in their work, that they had really distinct policy objectives that they're working on. We looked at timeliness, and so for us, and I think for the organizations, hopefully this planning phase will, you know, again, kind of not only gel some of the new partners that they might be bringing in, but also kind of help them move work that they've already been working on anyway. And so even if, um, some of the groups don't get funded from this exercise. My hope is that they will, one, establish partnerships and relationships with the other folks that will go beyond the grant. Two, they will be in a better position to reach out to other funders, which is, I think, again, one of our roles again. Um, and what I say to folks that I talk to, even if I can't fund you, hopefully I can find somebody who can. Um, and I think, again, it's just having that time and that process when you're bringing in new folks to understand where each other's coming from. Um, and really, uh, when you have, you know, because as a, you know, maybe as Catalyst or as PSR, you kind of have a plan or intention, but when you bring five other folks in the room, oh my gosh, how much stronger a plan can you come up with? And it might totally bunk everything that you thought about. And so I think having time to do that, to iterate, to, you know, because things shift, policies shift, um, decision makers leave and come. So really, we think of this planning phase as one of gelling, um, you know, one of really getting clear about what that objective should look like at the end, but also relationship building, which, again, goes beyond the grant. So that's a little bit. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. Yeah. And um, ladies? Yeah, I am super thankful. Thank you <laughs> for the for the planning phase because I feel like when when I've written grant reports before that first mid year or year or whatever it's like well actually our timeline has shifted because it took you know I mean it's just inherent particularly with new project work no matter what sort of foundations you know that that you have so 
you know, we have the foundation for, you know, our vision and values workshop and how we establish our circles and, and what our principles are, but what does the work look like, actually? Um, we have, we'll be having our first Central Circle meeting um, next week, which will start with that vision values workshop exercise. And even I've been thinking this, you know, this week, like listening to some of the sessions, like, okay, like, you know, bringing our energy folks in, but I'm already thinking about what, what does our sort of scope of work, you know, look like? We have a new partner in Smart Growth America, um, which is sort of a new type of partnership um, for us that super relevant, particularly, you know, in Atlanta and you know, transportation issues, you know, and, and equity and planning. So I appreciate having the time to be messy um, here in the beginning, um, and also capacity. You know, I think sometimes, you know, we jump into these projects, I think, unfortunately, nonprofits are just really bad sometimes at, at operations and underestimating how much um, programmatic operational support that it takes to launch new initiatives um, and successfully. So we, you know, brought on, you know, a new health organizer. We had a consultant who was in the lead, but we had to bring on a prop, you know, like a, a program manager. So even just like the organizational changes um, that that it takes, um, because we we do have to vision three years in, in, into the future. Um, because we will continue, you know, our, our, our health equity work because we still have this other project. So it's it's a it's a good breathing moment um, for us to be able to have that have that planning time. Yeah, so I definitely agree with all of that. I think the more like the deeper I get into this work, the more I realize that if you come into a room with already your ideas of how things should go, your solutions and not once have you asked community members, whoever is being impacted by um, that potential idea, what they think about it, what do they see as their path forward, then you're already starting off on the wrong foot with the work. Um, so I think, definitely agree with what already has been said, like the beauty of having that year long planning process is that we do get to have these conversations with um, different stakeholders and people that uh, we really want to hear from and to make sure that everything that we're building out, these policies that will hopefully change things for us in the future, that they're really rooted at, um, from what like community members want, from what we know healthcare practitioners see as important. Um, that's, that's really, really vital to this work. So I think had we just jumped right into the implementation phase, I, I'm pretty sure that um, <coughs> that wouldn't be as successful as what we're doing now. Um, and this definitely takes time, I think, that's the other thing with partnerships. Um, some will come more quickly than others. Sometimes it takes more time. Um, there might be you know, bumps along the way, and it's important to take note of that. Um, but the more I learn about community organizing, what that should look like, what engagement should look like, um, engagement that's very intentional um, and built around trust, it just takes a really long time. Like Going to the other work that Catalyst does, um, you know, we're branching out our work into five different target areas in the county, and I can definitely say there's some communities that we've had more success with that we're moving along more quickly, and others where there's just not many institutions in place, there's not that infrastructure in place. Um, so even in, from that perspective, um, we recognize that, okay, we probably can't start in five areas at once. We need to probably do, you know, a couple communities one year and then start to slowly build things out because it's just not possible. And I think <coughs> having that flexibility is really important to just recognize that it won't always go the way you expect it to. So that's just my, my thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, so again, I put to you this room. Uh, if you have questions for these, uh, these women and the work that they're doing on climate change and health and equity, there's a microphone right here. Um, on. Got a very quiet. I see a movement. <laughs>
uh, different organizations and companies that are here in this room today. So, I, I, my organization is a physician created and largely physician led. Uh, we work on um, climate and energy related policy across the country at both the federal and the state and local levels through our chapters. Sometimes it's hard for our folks. I, mean, I actually think that we have some of the best doctors in the country, um, really um, values driven and um, wonderful people. And yet at the same time, we are, I recognize, it's a very elite kind of group. I mean, physicians especially, highly um, educated, at the top of their professional hierarchy, used to being in charge. Not necessarily the best people to bring into um, a, a community-based uh, work or coalition. And so, and, and for I think people in this room who may you know include uh, you know engineers and, and uh, you know kind of both highly educated and technical folk, I I think that entering into coalition with community people can actually be a little daunting or intimidating in an area where our intentions may be the best, but we worry about tripping up, you know, doing bad things, screwing things up. Uh, any advice for us? Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think the, most of our conversation has been about like uncommon allies, um, if you will. I'm always concerned about, oh my gosh, you know, did we set this meeting up the right way? Is, you know, are we making good use of people's time? Um, but I think it goes back to the conversation that, the other question that we had about, you know, people will flow in and out, you know, and that is, I think, part of the process of building, you know, um, coalition work. You know who you need, um, maybe a, Lots of dating and relationship references <laughs> this morning, I, I, um, but but I think it's true. Some people are going to try it on; it doesn't fit, you know. And you may be able to reach out to them for certain things, but I know I've come to learn that there are people that I can make a phone call to, or I can send an email to, and I can ask them for something very specific, and I can get it back. But they may not necessarily come, you know to the meeting every month or, or stay the whole time or, um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, that's, that's just gonna happen and you just figure out with each other, you know, what, what the best contribution has to be. I think humility is really important and to make sure that that's coming from both sides of the table. Um, I think, uh, you know, a lot of us, I don't think, get training around how to have tough conversations or how to be able to handle, you know, um, someone yelling at you for whatever reason. Um, I think it's important to have more of that, like, social, emotional training and, and learning how to deal with those situations. Because I think that's definitely something I never got training on um, in school at any point. It's something that I learned about being at Catalyst and then, you know, just being in situations where you have to recognize and understand that people are living their lives, there are things that they're going through, we all have things that come up. Um, so yeah, sometimes someone might blow up at you for a reason, um, but being able to like handle that is really important. Um, and I think going back to who we're talking about, like healthcare uh, practitioners, people who are at the top of their field, um, you know, I think it's really important to find those champions within those uh, fields to be able to be kind of, you know, that intermediary uh, for those conversations. So um, I know Dr. Holder, I mentioned your name again, but I don't know where you're at, but um, I know Andrea during the meeting, she mentioned that even for her, it's not always easy to breach those conversations, but I think it's even just finding someone like that that can um, help to start those conversations is, is really important and giving that time, I know especially with doctors, Time is such a big issue. They are always in a hurry to have one patient after the other. Um, but I think that's why it's also really important to have these wider um, initiatives where we're trying to build it into the curriculum for um, medical students so that they learn these things before they're out in the field. So I think that's something else we haven't talked about, but 
I know there are people out there in this room um, that are working on that, and it's also important to keep a focus on that, because I think the earlier we get them talking about those things and like the social side of things as well, it'll help us along the way as they come into being doctors. The only thing that I would add really quickly is that some folks don't need to work in the community. <laughs> So we have our, our Robin Tops, you know, I did that for 15 years. Physicians, um, architects, some folks just don't get along with people. And that's okay. So we have to know when to say, that's fine, babe, stay in your lane. So that's the first thing. But, but for those that, that are willing to come into community and work in true partnership, I think the one thing that's really, that I found is really important is you know, kind of get into humility, but realizing that sometimes you've had communities that have trusted and worked with folks from the outside, and that trust has been broken. So I think making sure that in those first meetings, whether it's understanding your shared vision, whatever, that you take the time to listen as an outsider, engineer, or whatever, physician, and hear what folks are saying, understand maybe how they've been hurt, how they've been impacted, and, and really appreciate and respect that, and know that it's not always gonna be this automatic trust in you're my best friend. That takes time. So I think, again, just appreciating where people are at, what they've experienced, healing is real, and you can't begin to really work together until you heal together. So that's just one thing that I've learned, and despite the, the number of letters behind your name, despite your certifications, all that goes out the door when you were talking about working in true partnership. It's important, but you gotta, you gotta leave your ego at the door. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name's Rebecca Rear. I'm the Director of the Climate for Health Program at Eco America. Um, thank you for your remarks this morning and for your ongoing work and dedication to these issues. Um, I think at the end of the day, I'm a realist, I, you know, to get things done, um, I'm a pragmatic person, but that doesn't change the fact that I am fundamentally disappointed that climate change is a political issue in this country. Um, and unfortunately, also addressing structural racism is, uh, has become a partisan issue as well. It, in, in my experience, it's, there's one party that's more willing to openly discuss that and try to address it explicitly without dancing around it using other terms or making excuses. Um, so what are your thoughts or advice for, uh, I think both at a 30,000 foot level and sort of for those of us working to shift the policy, you know, shift policy or shift discussions on those issues and connect, connect them, but then also for folks who are working in community who are trying to implement an energy efficiency program who are, you know, a lot of, who I think a lot of folks are in this room, and it might be different advice, um, but, but what are your thoughts or advice for folks who are, keep running into walls because some of these cl climate change and structural racism are, are uh, partisan issues in this country. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we don't even sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just saying that's a, a very deep question. Um, just light fodder for the flag. Thanks, Rebecca. I mean, when you were talking, I was thinking about how, I know for us, for example, even though we're doing this climate work um, and we're trying to recruit, for example, for our climate leadership program that we have, um, sometimes I just don't mention climate change to yeah. people. Um, and it might not even be because of like political affiliation or whatever, it's, it might be just because it sounds daunting to them. There's a, a number of reasons why people get turned off by that term. Um, something that we've done as an organization is that we've done um, these community visioning workshops in different in the different communities that we want to do our more localized work in. And more often than not, um, no one ever said that climate change was their, their top issue. Um, for us, affordable housing is always a top priority. Um, so something that we've done is that, and this is the work that Zalom has been leading um, with our Miami Climate Alliance, a, a local coalition that we have there, um, is connecting like housing justice with like energy justice, for example, and that's been very <coughs> successful and been ongoing for months now. 
Um, and that's one where you start to kind of open up the door and connect those dots for people. I think it is on us to figure out those connections, but we also can't, you know, force climate down someone's throat. It just doesn't work. So I think it's important to, you know, do the work, do the research. I think that's why the planning um, phase of this is so important to get to realize like what those issues are that people care about and realize that climate change might not be the top priority. But we know that everything connects back to climate change, um, so that's kind of like your entry point to be able to make it a bit more palatable, I would say. Yeah, these are these are huge, difficult um, question of life topics, <laughs> right? Um, so we don't, you know, always you know, lead with, with climate change either. And I'll, I'll mention an example. Um, when I was at South Face Energy Institute, um, our co founder and executive director, Dennis Creech, we had a, it's called Earthcraft, um, which is our green building program, you know, focused on the Southeast, but working with builders in the South. You know, it's like, I'm not running into a home builders association meeting, you know, 10 years ago, we run into Georgia Home Builders Association talking about climate change, right? We're talking about building materials, we're talking about energy efficiency. So I think, you know, that example um, sticks with me particularly when, when working with community because before you jump to the issue, it's like what's important to the person that, that you're talking to? Um, where is the place to open up a conversation to move towards these bigger generational, you know, life questions and um, and having a conversation about, um, I had a student from Georgia Tech ask me what I was doing a talk and he was like, well, he's like, but the grid is the grid. How can, how can the grid be racist? And it was, <laughs> It was a really good question, right? Because, you know, it's like the engineering program, you know, at, at Georgia Tech. I mean, it was, it was a really good question, but there's so many different entry points, I feel like, that you have to look at. Who am I talking to? Um, what am I going to be asking of them? What kind of relationship am I, you know, going to be asking of them? And um, because we are uncomfortable, structural racism, racism, white supremacy, those, that is uncomfortable, but we have to talk about it. But part of that journey, I think, that we've been all talking about is just that everybody's not ready. Um, you know, even you know, in, in our own coalition work, we lead with race. We, we're a racial equity organization. You know, these things we just we just have to be who we are, and everybody's not ready. Sometimes, you know, everybody's not going to be working in community. You know, I think it's. It's difficult, and we just have to stumble along and, and be authentic about wanting to, you know, wanting to advance real systemic change. So um, we'll get there a lot of different ways. Uh, yes, Marty Kushler, AC Triple I'll try to ask a little less risky question for you. <laughs> um, bring it down to a more specific issue. There's a particular sweet spot where climate, health, and energy come together, and that is the area of home retrofits that address both energy efficiency and health factors within the home. And I'm wondering if uh, you all could talk about any experiences you've had where you've had some success working with utility companies and folks uh, connected with the health community in that type of effort where, where home retrofits to address energy and, and health issues are taken care of. I'm laughing. Yeah. Um, I was just making eyes and so on. Um, well, in Florida, we have um, a monopoly utility. Um, so um, that's tough to work with. Um, our franchise agreement was up um, like a year or so ago. Um, and because they already have so much infrastructure in place in terms of like laws and stuff like that, they decided they didn't even need the franchise agreement. Um, so we were trying to battle this for months, um, and then we learned that the franchise agreement wasn't happening again. Um, so instead of working with them, um, there was a campaign um, where we had community members, a bunch of different partners from um, the coalition I mentioned, the Climate kind of Alliance, meeting with. Um, elected officials um, locally to talk about the different demands that we had around like our weatherization program, for example, 
Um, so through the success and being very persistent with meeting with different people and explaining why we thought that was important, um, almost half a million dollars were added to the budget. Um, so the reason I was laughing is because we didn't work with the utilities on that um, because they essentially shut themselves out. Um, but we found another avenue to do that work. Um, so I'm from Georgia, and Georgia Power is um, our, our investor-owned utility. Um, so that is difficult. Um, it's my last interaction with them was at a demonstration outside of our public service commission <laughs> relative to our rate case that just um, wrapped up. So, so that's that. And, um, and through our lawyers at Southern Environmental Law Center. Right? So that's, uh, that, that's our, not all of our relationship, right? Um, we do have to work with them. I am still navigating a lot of what is possible um, within, a, a, within a lot of the um, Georgia Power Program um, structures. So it's just having a conversation with someone I just met um, from um, a minority-owned energy efficiency organization um, that, that used to work with Georgia Power about even the differences she recognized in Detroit, you know, versus Atlanta around some of some of the measures and things like that. So there's lots of different programs. Um, you know, we want to improve them and want to understand them better um, to make sure that communities even know that they are available to them. So I, I think that's a lot of it. Um, also trying to make sure that, so um, our Atlanta Community Action Agency is a partnership in, in our Just Energy Circle, and we're building relationships with um, the others, 19, 18, across, um, across the state of Georgia, because, you know, that's where, like, on the weatherization side. Um, so really, we're just, it's kind of difficult to figure out, um, but I'm looking forward to, I'm trying to understand those better and pass that information um, on to community because we do know what those you know connections are. Not necessarily trying to um, worry so much about what's happening within that utility structure versus trying to make sure that we're working with community to make sure they understand um, you know even those at George Power but within the. 42 electric membership cooperatives that we have um, in the state of Georgia and the 11 municipally owned um, utilities even understand, one, what programs are available just at a baseline, two, why they're important and how they can access them, um, and three, around our community organizing tactics is that when they ask a question and I have to say, well, actually, you know, that's not available to you or, you know, you, you that or you don't qualify, and they say why, and I said, well, actually, you can go down to 244 Washington Street, where the Public Service Commission is, they are supposed to be there every day, um, and, and you can talk to them. So really, it's about um, those immediate interventions, but also making sure that we are developing the civic muscle of community to understand who the decision makers are. Um, that they need to constantly put pressure on, um, vote on, we have a publicly elected commission in Georgia. Um, a lot of people don't even know there's a public service commission. So that's, that's where we're, um, we're, we're doing our work. I'll just make a quick comment. I wish I could share with you a success story. Um, but I, I still have hope, and I think there's so much opportunity um, so again, from Detroit, Michigan, um, and when I was uh, working with one of the organizations that did weatherization in the city, particularly for the seniors that I was working with that lived in single family homes, first of all, it was this, um, it was really hard to get good data. I, I tried to reach out to our main utility because I wanted to one, understand what was the usage in different communities, particularly related to impervious surfaces. Um, what was the cost, and even with the permission of, you know, kind of my seniors that participated, it was just really hard to get that data. But I think, again, that is where data can be super powerful. And, you know, again, I think it's to both parties' benefit that, one, if you can figure out why this little single-family home is using up so much energy, that, that helps with your bottom line utility company. So if there's a way that we can, again, build 
partnerships and trust where we can use the data for good. That's going to benefit not only you know understanding where we, we, we see our energy hogs and what communities are using more, particularly these are low income communities with homes that the envelope is just jacked up that have attempted to um, make use of weatherization programs, but oh, their roof isn't the best. I mean, there's always something. So how do we, when, as you talk about structural pieces, how do we remove these barriers so that we can actually take advantage of these programs that are gonna benefit both utility companies, bottom line, because that essentially, I mean, it comes down to money most of the time, and also be a benefit to these community members. So. Um, I would love, you know, and I'm sure hopefully there's someone in the audience that has maybe used data um, at the household level to help kind of, I don't know, um, inform, shape programs, policies, or whatever. So um, if you're out there, let me know, because I want to hear a success story. <laughs> okay. Um, Are you, you're well, I think, yeah, we're, we've just reached the, at the end of our time. I'm so grateful, and I'd just like to give everybody up here a, um, a round of applause. still have questions, um, please feel free to uh, to come speak with these women about the work that they're doing and, and um, if there's synergy there that you can work together. All right, thank you.